still on in Spain, and specialized in peace studies and international relations. Not only biographically, but also intellectually, he has a unique perspective on the potentials and problems of Africa and has published extensively about this. He is now Professor of International Relations at the Management Center Innsbruck and at the same institution, Head of the Department of Studies of Social Work, Social Policy and Management. He co-edited with Andreas Müller, our second speaker, uh, the volume Human Trafficking and Exploitation, Lessons from Europe. The title of his paper is Beyond Root Causes, a Critical Appraisal of the U EU Migration Policy Towards Africa. Please, you have the stage. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to, to this, my small short presentation. Uh, I would like to focus on, on this topic, which is um, migration. And the title, as you can see, is saying beyond root causes. So why am I dealing with this issue, root causes, or especially saying beyond root causes? Most of the times when you read articles, um, newspapers, or you follow the news on the media, um, there are two main causes addressed by the politicians, by academicians, especially by the politicians and by the media, that if poverty is going to be addressed, if conflicts are being solved or managed, there will not be migration. So is that the case? And that's why I would like to discuss briefly with you, because there is not much time for, for a detailed discussion, but at least to give an overview why are poverty and um, conflicts not enough to address the causes of migration? Are there also other causes? So I am not going to address these questions in details, but at least it is important to keep them in mind to what extent are absolute poverty and violence, the driving forces behind migration? What is the rate of African migrants and refugees in Europe in comparison with other origins? Why is Africa the main focus of the European migration policy? So it sounds, at least um, in this moment, that my focus is going to be just to focus on, on, the, on the European migration policy, on the data, what it is. But I would like to discuss more or go, go deeply into the idea behind migrating. Why do people migrate? Not just in the, in the European case, in the African case, but also if we see it also from historical perspective, there are various reasons. If you take migrants from, from Germany, from England, from Ireland to United States in the 19th century, the, the paradigm is not much different from uh, today's um, migration or migration uh, motivations. So is there a big difference? I don't think that there is a big difference. Uh, the paradigm is more or less uh, similar. So let me start with some data. Especially, I don't know how many of you come from Europe and how many of you are not from Europe and how much are you. In the influx of migration into Europe was so, so big. Um, there was, you know, there this, this attempt to explain why do people move and where do they come from. Um, and if you follow, if you have been following the past years, especially on the policy level, the European policy or Austrian policy or German policy or, or other policies, national policies, most of the times the focus, uh, have been, the focus has been on African migration to Europe. And if you compare this with the data, you can uh, 
assumptions and what the reality, the statistics tells us. So as you can see here, the data is from 2018 and 2017. 79% um, of Africans move within the same region or neighboring countries. That means within the same region means that if they are from western part of Africa, they stay in the western part. If they are from central part of Africa, in the central part, etc. So that is what is meant by, by the region. So 22% immigrate outside of Africa, including Europe. As you can see, less than 15% uh, immigrating to Europe or North America, others going to, uh, to Asia, Australia, especially, or, or New Zealand. So the main recipients of intra-African migrants are, as you can see, Africans themselves, as African countries. So the interesting thing is, even if data does not tell, statistics does not tell you always everything, but it is sometimes helpful uh, to see, um, especially to compare it with with the debate, with the um, debate on the media on level or on the level of the politicians. And so it is interesting to see how many go to, to African countries and I don't want to, uh, to read it out. So data is taken from UNCTAD, from Brookings Institution, um, also similar other institutions, actually quite reliable sources. Now, my important question in this presentation is could the, risk, the, could the search for identity be a driving force of migration besides poverty, conflict, and environmental destruction? And, you know, in 2015, the European Union came up with different suggestions. It was in September 2015 when the influx of migrant, migration was so high in Europe that Europeans were say, saying, okay, we have to do something, we have to stop this, and, and um, there must be some kind of regulation. Of course, before that even, the years before, even I would say almost a decade before that, there was a policy um, on the European level how to undercut immigration to Europe. There were different bilateral agreements, multilateral agreements, but especially in 2015, um, they created, during the summit, so-called the Valletta Summit, um, the European Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. And in this European Emergency Trust Fund for Africa, they focused in this document, it was there was a declaration or plan of action, uh, conflicts, environmental destruction, and poverty as the main driving forces. My motivation here is to go beyond this. That's why the title is saying beyond the root causes, because according to policymakers, these are the root causes, but I am not that sure that these are the real root causes. And, and I would say it is very difficult to identify root causes for migration. And that is not typically African, it is not typically European, it is typically human, and we do not know always why people move. Maybe because of part of our human history that we always move. I mean, the territories came to existence, but in spite of territories, we, we by, our, by our nature, um, try to move. And I am myself kind of living example. As, uh, as the introductor, as uh, the presenter said before. So I, when I moved 26 years, almost 26 years ago to, to Austria, to Innsbruck, I was not intending to stay here. I was uh, intending to finish my studies and go back uh, to, to Ethiopia, but you know, for various reasons, um, I, I stayed here, and I am not an exception. And there, I think there are many, many people. And uh, while my, during my first studies, I was never intending to go to Europe either, because I was I was not thinking about going abroad, just staying and finishing my studies. So I'm not an exception. There are many people like like myself, and they, you cannot explain all those cases through uh, conflict, poverty, or environmental destruction. Now, why I'm telling you all this story is that if conflicts or poverty were the main causes, and why are people moving even if the economic situation is improving? I am just in this case focusing, of course, on, on Africa, and that is compiled by myself by taking data from different sources. And these are, um, at least in the African context, the main uh, origin countries. 
And if you see here the overall socioeconomic security trend, in most of the cases, not just improving, it is massively improving. And at the same time, you can see that migration is in most of the cases also, in certain cases also massively increasing, significantly increasing. Um, if the causes, as I said before, are poverty, I would say, okay, the economic situation is improving, there, there should be less immigration. But that is not the case. And there, is, um, there are many, case, many studies which show us that if the development progress, that means the economic growth, would increase as it has been increasing for the past two decades, um, those poor countries, they would reach the level where the migration would stop the, the earliest in 60 years. In 60 years, that is if you increase the, the amount of development aid in a, in a, in a sub, substantial way, the, imp, the economy would grow and the people would reach about when they earn, for example, between 8,000 and 10,000 US dollars. That is, that per head I mean, the migration would start to decrease. And these countries would reach that level the earliest in 60 years and if the progress continues in a regular, in the normal way, that would be achieved in 80 years. So that is the earliest possible. So the conclusion would be, so development aid actually would not make sense, at least in the short period. That means it is not the, in the interest of the Europeans to increase development aid. It should be rather the other way around. They should rather decrease if they would like to cut migration. So, European migration policy is actually counterproductive for the Europeans. So the best solution for the Europeans, if the, 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 the poverty argument goes on, in their best interest, they should cut um, development aid, development cooperation, and, and protect their borders. So the effect of development cooperation is just the other way around. And to show you just one example, uh, this is um, data taken from Afrobarometer 2019 from last March. And I'm like, I would like to emphasize again why this poverty discourse is not that sufficient. Here you see um, the reasons why people move. It is from, from Africa. Uh, there, there was data taken from the survey between 2016 and 2018. More than 45,000 people, people were interviewed in different countries, 34 countries, and reason for, for considering migrating. So here, you can see why people move and which group. For example, high-lived poverty, those who experience high-lived poverty, to find what they would move. Uh, Low-lived poverty here, moderate-lived poverty here, and uh, no lived poverty also you can see here. That means interestingly, if the, if the logic works according to European migration policy, this one should be very, actually very limited, but it is even much big, bigger than um, the high lived poverty uh, group. So this tells us, also you can, you can see in other categories here. Yeah? So this tells us that People migrate not only to, to overcome poverty or to flee conflicts, but there are also other reasons. As I said before, if you take, for example, how many Germans lived Germany between 1820 and 1860 before the Civil War in the United States went to, to, to the United States, it were, they were not just the poor Germans, uneducated Germans, it was the Germans who lived for the United States were the, the highly skilled Germans who left. Um, they were the richest, or at least they belonged to the richest group, except Ireland, even England, in England, from England, were more or less the paradigm was the same, like Germany. So it was not over, if you take Ireland, it would say, okay, maybe poverty played a role, but if you take Germany, and especially, that is not always the case. So <clears throat> one important researcher suggests that it is not just poverty, it is uh, a social transformation, that means the social transformation that also contributes to migration. That's why where I try to go to this identity discourse, 
There is change taking place in societies, economically, politically, culturally, psychologically. There is transformation taking place. In many African countries, if you take 20 years before, 20 years ago, the situation was much more desperate, but the, the migration at that time was not as high as it is now. So in many countries, this, there is this improvement, at the same time there is this increase. And he is suggesting that migration is, according to Castles, one part of the process of transformation of structure and institutions which arises through major changes in global political, economic, social relationships. So that's why I will, I'm trying to, to, to show this link between kind of new emerging identity among people uh, and which pushes them to, to migrate to look for something else, not just to, to, to earn uh, some money. So to what extent is the national identity discourse, that's why I'm asking here, this, uh, raising this question, is shaping the migration policy of the destination countries. So here, what I'm, I would like to address is that um, Africa, by making Africa the main focus of this migration policy, the European migration policy kind of um, misleading us the, um, in the migration discourse. So first of all, it is not necessarily poverty conflict that push people, first of all, not always. There, yeah, of course, to some extent, but not always. And secondly, and actually Africans are not the main, African, uh, from African countries are not the main countries of origin that migrate to, 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 to Europe. And I would like to show you the data here. Now, let's start with 2015 and 2016. How many people migrated to Europe during that time? And African countries are actually quite, quite low, um, down, down the page somewhere. It is not Africans, it was other, from other regions that people migrated to Europe, they, but the migration policy of the European Union was all the time focusing on Africa. If you take, for example, uh, the Marshall Plan with Africa, which was suggested by Germany and also taken by some, some other countries, and there was no any ma Marshall Plan for, I don't know, Syria, or for Afghanistan, or for Iraq, there was no Marshall Plan, but for Africa, there was a Marshall Plan. But then you ask the question, why is that? Yeah. So here, you, 2016 and 2017, you can compare the data. It's more or less similar. It is not African countries, the main sending countries, rather other regions. If you take uh, 2017, that is from the European Asylum Support Office, EASM means European Asylum Support Office, which is something official, the official, let us say, source of data. And I highlighted, um, read the African countries and others are... Um, just in black, just to, 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 to separate, to show you that Africans are not main countries of origin. It is, it, is, it is other. Now the question is why is all the time the migration policy focusing on Africa, not on other regions? Or if you take 2017 and 2018, you compare, since the EASO's report has not yet uh, been issued for 2019, just that's why I would like to focus only on 2017 and 18. So um, here you can see these are 10 countries, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Nigeria, Iran, Turkey, Venezuela, Albania, Georgia. And it is only Nigeria you, you find in this list of the 10 um, for 2018 as well as for 2017. So that's why I'm saying from the African side, it is not necessarily the, most, the, the poorest or the, those groups who are, which are acutely affected by conflicts and poverty who are living, and that is the one side. On the other side, the European migration policy is saying we have to address the root causes, but it is not addressing the root causes of the main countries of origin and instead African countries. So that, that's where my question is, why is that? So, if you take the, um, if it is from last May, the EASO, again from EASO uh, data, the most common country of origin of application in May 2019, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, they jointly making about a quarter of all applications and top, Africa, um, uh, top country of origin, again, only Nigeria. Yeah. So it is interesting if you see, for example, the home affairs and migration homepage of the European Union, um, 
there, there is a lot of data, there is a lot of information, uh, but the, the different initiatives and cooperation uh, documents, uh, my colleague afterwards, Andreas Müller, who is expert in this, maybe he will touch uh, on some, some of those points, um, they focus many uh, times on African causes and conflicts, how to cooperate. Um, so it makes me um, question wh what is the reason behind, yeah? So, and this kind of discourse all the time focusing on Africa is, has been also creating kind of populism. The populism, of course, in general, it is about immigrants, against immigrants, let us say. But um, as I'm going to show briefly, um, there is a data which is shown as increasing violence against black Africans. Yeah? The populism, you know, to, become, to be a foreigner um, in a let me say, to be a, a German foreign in Austria and an African foreign in Austria, I think that is, uh, um, two, they are, these are two different things, yeah? So, so um, immigration as the main focus of writing populism in Europe in general, but the question is where does populism come from? Where, where, where does, that, that, does it come from? So there are different authors trying to explain us the cause of my, um, populism, at least from economic point of view, saying there is a kind of uh, demand side and there is kind of supply side from demand side from the side of the population, supply side from the side of the politicians who mobilized people um, against, against the foreigners. And uh, there are other econ economists who say that it is not that clear cut, especially this one, I don't know how many of uh, you can read German, I think very interesting interesting book who sees that it is not generally about poverty or um, unemployment and instead about the welfare state system where the welfare state is well established or not that plays a role where their populism arises. Yeah? So there are different studies. I would like just to mention how this populism first of all come in because of immigrants and especially which type of immigrants are being affected or addressed by populists especially in a violent way. And another one um, from, from these two authors, um, in this political economy of liberal democracy, uh, they distinguish in different groups. According to them, there are two, uh, three different groups uh, regarding uh, populism, how populists see people differentiated, the elite on the one side, the minorities on the other side, and the real people uh, on their third place. Yeah? The elites, of course, they, are, um, they have to be deposed from the power, and the minorities, they are in the wrong place. They don't belong here because of their ethnicity, religion, and because of their status. And of course, the real people are the people from here, born here, grew up here, have the same language, religion, etc. And they differentiate here, based on this analysis, these two cleavages. On the one hand, this ethnocultural cleavage, on the other hand, income social class cleavage. Yeah? And these populists mobilized, or populists mobilized um, against the enemies of the people based on these cleavages. So who are the enemies? The enemies could be the elite, the enemies could be the minorities. And based on the ideological positioning, um, it, for the right-wing populists, it is rather the, the identity issue and for the left-wing populists, especially um, what we, we could observe uh, in Latin America and also Southern Europe, and the, rather the income cleavage that means the against neoliberalism and the capitalism. So they explain this, uh, this rise in populism, especially how this populism is going, moving towards or against, against immigrants. Now, if we take, to, for example, two examples, I would like to, um, Approaching to, uh, to, to end uh, my, my presentation, uh, Spain has somewhat larger migrant stock in relation to its population. The interesting thing is that the majority of Spain's immigrants come from similar countries and cultures, from Latin America, where Spanish is spoken, and the immigrants are not very much different from their, their history and their, their background of their language, also from the religious perspective. But if you compare, contrast this what with France, more than 40% are from Muslim countries, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Turkey, and 10% from Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Um, even if there is a colonial link, at least from the uh, from historical perspective, the language is most of the time different. Culture, uh, history, of course, be because of colonization, the same. But especially the religion weight plays a big role. So the right wing Front National has much more fertile ground in France than in Spain, um, as 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 some some data shows us. Yeah. Now this leads me to. Is to, um, to this identity issue which I mentioned at the beginning because migration, immigration as well as migration policy, it is not just about economy, it is not about addressing conflicts, but it is more about um, looking for someone who could be excluded or who could be included. And um, according to this scapegoating violence against immigrants which we, are, we see increasingly in Europe, so the majority, as I, I, I mentioned before, the majority class feels that it is social status under threat and that its future is, its pro prospects are in jeopardy because of immigration. So there must be a solution. There, there must be um, uh, regulation and cutting this, uh, this inf um, influx. The demagogues intensifies, according to this author, the people's fear and throws scapegoats at their feet who are blamed for all their misery in the, if there is... Um, Unemployment, increasing unemployment, if there is violence, if women are um, in certain cases raped, it must be primarily because of refugees or the refugees. Yeah? And um, as our colleague Wolfgang Palava says in one of his articles, the possessive identification with the people is often accompanied by a strong separation between a very positive view of we and a image of despised others. So that is what we are going to see, we are seeing nowadays in the in the populist discourse, not only just, uh, just, the, just the classical populist, but also many politicians in order to um, win the, the, the votes or the election, how they mobilize people, people against others. Yeah? So as Jan Müller says, populists are anti-elitist, they are moralist, they are anti-pluralist. But interesting here, interesting thing is that the pluralism is not just a general pluralism, it is rather selective pluralism. The selective, which means here, there are some people, even if they are foreigners, they are less foreigners than others. Yeah? So here, I finished, I, I, I would like to read out this um, from Francis Fukuyama, who, who showed us from the identity, from culture, from the religious point of view. Maybe I go back to this one again. This selectively means that we have to differentiate or the migration policies of the European countries or, or individual state or, or even on the institutional level, there is a kind of selective identification. Even if, as I said before, the majority of refugees and asylum seekers are not coming from Africa, but the, 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 the focus is all the time on African countries. Is it Many people would not agree with my position. Is it because Africans has as Africans have a different culture, different religion, especially different looking because of their color, that they will be treated in a different way? And I remember um, I had a couple of months ago a discussion with an official from Ministry of Internal Affairs in Austria, and I asked him if you know because you know this data, if you know this data that Africans are not the biggest group in Europe. Why are I all the time focusing on Africa? And he told me, African population is increasing. Um, in uh, 2050, it is going to be, um, it is going to, um, to be the, the, the biggest region, that means population-wise, the, the largest region in the world. China is going to be behind Africa, India is going to be behind Africa, and uh, these people are going to move to Europe, and um, therefore we have to do something before something happens. It's not what the current data that pushes us to focus on Africa and instead what could happen in the future. That means Africans are going to come, they are not going to stay in Africa. Uh, I asked him, how do you know that? He said, so what are, what are they doing, going to do otherwise? So there is no perspective for them in the future. But interesting thing, um, if you compare African countries, especially um, at least some of the countries, if you take 10, the most, the fastest growing economies in the world at the moment, at least since four, 
for the past uh, four or five years, the fastest growing economies in the world, six of them are in Africa and four of them are in Asia. And actually nobody knows, and no, not in many academicians who are actually from, from economic background, they don't want to know, they don't know that. Yeah. So um, that's why my question, why don't we focus on, this, on these issues that people are working, people are being educated, there are universities, there are education centers, there are training centers, people are investing, people have become innovative, and they are working hard in an African context, but why don't you focus on those issues? You know, these, these things require more interest, that you, that you research more in order to know more, um, and that is, um, that is not, in, in the African case, that important. That's actually uh, my impression. So, um, yeah, so this selectivity, as I mentioned before, there are many foreigners, but some foreigners are more foreigners than others. Yeah. Um, here, in, in the, from the countries of destination point of view, the feeling of being treated like migrants and refugees, pushing many people to be um, followers of populist uh, movements or populist parties. Yeah. So there, must, there, there is the desire to be treated as, as local people, as autochthonous people, and not to be treated as, as, um, as immigrants. And in 2010, there was a reform in Germany, and in the welfare reform, and also it has, it has been increasing for the past uh, years. Um, if this welfare state reform is going to take place, it is going to treat refugees and uh, long-term um, unemployed people in a, different, in a similar way. So even if your education, the past was very high, very good, if you were well earning quite well, after one year, if you are not going to get another job, you will be treated more or less like, the, like a refugee or an asylum seeker. So from the identity point of view, as a German employed, educated person treated after one year as a refugee is a kind of degrading. So this kind of differentiation and uh, um, uh, being treated in a special way is going to be uh, not any more existent, and that makes people fear. So those citizens fear loss of middle class status, point an accusatory finger upward to the elites and downward to, toward the poor, whom they feel are undeserving and being unfairly favored. That means the refugees and asylum seekers. And I took this one from Francis Fukuyama. I just, I, I, I took it as it is because I find it very interesting point. The nationalists can translate loss of relative economic position into loss of identity and status. You have always been a core of our great nation, but foreigners, immigrants, and your own elite compatriots have been conspiring to, to hold you down. Your country is no longer your own, and you are not respected in your own land. Similarly, the religious partisan can say something almost identical. You are a member of a great community of believers who have been traduced by non-believers. This betrayal has led not just to your impoverishment, but is a crime against God himself. You may be invisible to your fellow citizens, but you are not invisible to God. So uh, that he is reflecting, uh, how many minutes? Over? Two? Okay, I'm almost done. Yeah? And that is where we see this kind of um, uh, categorical separation between who is, who belongs here, and who does not belong here, who comes from where, um, etc. So um, here, there is a just from this data, European Agency for Fundamental Rights from 2018. Um, it is about being black in the, in the EU, and it shows how this um, attack against blacks in, in, in the European or in European countries or in the European Union has increased. Yeah? So if you take Finland, sorry, Finland, Luxembourg, Ireland, Germany, etc., you see in the past years it has increased. Um, this violence is not comparable with, with other groups. Uh, that's why I said before some people, many people are foreigners, but some are more foreigners than others. Yeah? Um, so being black, that means that that differentiates you. You do not belong because of your color, because of your religion, and because of your culture, whatever. 
So you can see uh, how it has been increasing. At least that is the prevalence of perceived racist harassment in five years. And the data is uh, from 2016. And similarly, prevalence of perceived racist violence in five years before the survey uh, by country. And that is again mainly, uh, in this case, uh, against uh, black Africans. Now, the conclusion from this is that um, both migration policy, both migration policy from the point of view of destination countries as well as the motivation for migration, if they are all the time focusing on causes of migration, the classical causes of migration, I think they are going to miss the point because uh, the reason for why people migrate is not always poverty or conflicts, but also there are other uh, psychological, social, historical factors. And um, so that's why uh, I try to compare this um, based on the identity discourse. People move for, for, for because of globalization, because of social transformation, etc. Yeah? So there is no clear match between the migration policies, root cause, and the migrant decision-making processes here. And what is taking place nowadays is scapegoating against foreigners because of populism, especially against uh, certain social groups, um, has been increasing um, in the um, in the in, in, in many European countries. So I would like to end here my presentation. I hope I did not steal too much time from my allowed time. And thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. I heard that they are going to be after the presentation of my, my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gebrewald, for this fascinating and certainly non-mainstream view on Africa migration and uh, European migration policies. Um, we come to our second speaker before we can engage in lively discussion, I guess. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Andreas Müller, who is full professor of European law and public international law at Innsbruck University. He studied here, but his career also brought him among several other places to The Hague and Yale. His publication list is impressive, as is his list of other academic merits. What is extra remarkable, though, is how very much his intellectual capacity is matched by his practical commitment to vital questions of how to make our global village a place not only of juridical but also uh, humane justice. Among other, many other things, he is interested in international human rights law and European migration asylum law. Uh, in 2017, I've already mentioned the volume he co-edited with Professor Begebrevold um, called Human Trafficking and Exploitation Lessons from Europe. He will now tell us a tale of stranding, solidarity, and security uh, perspectives from asylum law. Andreas, the stage is yours. Thanks, Matthias, for the most kind words of introduction, if only half of it was true. So, and thanks for, and that in particular, thanks for inviting me to, to, to speak here. Hiketides, the suppliants, those who supplicate or plead for their escape, for their rescue, for their survival. Hikesia supplication is an experience that is as old as humanity. Thomas Hobbes forcefully reminds us in his Leviathan that the natural condition of humankind is one of competition and rivalry. And he knew perfectly well that the conditio humana is not simply embodied by the law of the stronger. For, quote, the weakest man is strong enough to kill the strongest, either by a secret plot or by an alliance with others who are in the same danger than he is in, end of quote. Thus, as human beings we are, or may at least, may at least easily come, into situations where we depend on the support of others, where we become Hiketides suppliants. Two ancient tragedians chose this fundamental experience as theme of their plays. In Aeschylus Hiketides, the 50 daughters of Danaos flee from Egypt 
to escape from a forced marriage to their cousins. When the Danaids reach Argos, they plead to King Pelascus to protect him. Eventually, the Argives decide to give them shelter within the city walls, even though the Egyptians threaten to wage war against Argos. A generation later, Euripides wrote his version of the Hecatidus. This time, the Argives were on the side of desperation. Adrastus, the king of Argos, had authorized a military expedition against Thebes, an expedition which utterly failed. According to the decree of Creon, the king of Thebes, the corpses of the killed Argives shall remain unburied. Ethra, the mother of the Athenian king Theseus, asks her son to intervene on their behalf and is supported in her request by the mothers of the slain warriors, the suppliants, the Hecatides. Relying on the ancient customs of Hellas, Theseus requests the release of the dead bodies from Creon, but he refuses. After a successful military exchange, Theseus obtains the corpses and washes them himself and prepares them for burial. These two plays were first performed in Athens in the fifth century before Christ, 2,500 years ago. Hence, they are fairly, fairly remote from us in terms of time. Yet, they are not far from us in terms of subject matter and geography. We heard already about that several times and we only have to follow the media to see that the Mediterranean is still the scene of thousandfold supplication. Every year, many, many thousands attempt to set over the sea to reach the shores of Europe. Many are drowned on their risky passage and crossing the Mediterranean becomes more and more dangerous according to the most recent figures from uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. In this year, already around 600 persons died on the Mediterranean, which is more or less one out of 45, so a bit more than 2%. Those who manage to cross or are safe from distress strand at the shores of Spain, Italy, Malta, Greece, and supplicate, ask for asylum. The etymology of asylum, as, as you know, is also Greek. It stands for sanctuary, inviolable place, place of refuge. Also, the 50 Danaids from Isilos play were refugees coming from the sea and seeking for asylum because they were fleeing from forced marriage. They asked for the solidarity of the people of Argos, and they could confidently do so because they had a claim of kinship to the Argives. As the Danaids do not forget to emphasize already in the introductory chorus of the play. But would the Hecatides also have had a case for asylum if they had not been the flesh and blood of Argus? What about real aliens that are linked to us by nothing but the bonds of humanity, by the mere fact of being an other? Is there something like a right to asylum just because one is a human being in distress? Maybe such solidarity in cosmopolitan vocation did not exist in antiquity, but this is different today, isn't it? Some will now proudly point to the 1951 Geneva Refugee Convention, and I would say they are 50% right to do so. I come back to this shortly. But even if we believe in solidarity with refugees, are there not limits to this? especially if there are serious security concerns, we will also see that the Refugee Convention balances the solidarity needs of refugees with the security interests of the receiving societies. Solidarity and security, these are two concepts that, that set the frame within which international and European asylum law are operating and evolving. And international and European asylum law is the very topic I was asked to speak about today in the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes. Let me do this in four steps. First, I'd like to turn to the international or global level and ask the question raised before, is there a right to asylum in the legal sense under contemporary international law? On this basis, we will explore in a second step the structure and functioning of the common European asylum system and the balances it tries to strike between on the one hand, the solidarity impulses of Europe or the European countries on on the other hand, the security reflexes of these very countries. In a further step, I'd like to address the one set of questions that the European states can agree upon in this area of conflict and dissent, 
This means a strongly security-driven agenda of protecting and cutting off Europe's external borders, notably with Africa. We already heard about that uh, from Schill before. In conclusion, we have to ask ourselves what the asylum saga teaches us regarding European identity. I think you could also give the following subtitle to my intervention between aspiration and failure, more leaning to the second side, to failure. Article 14 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights states, quote, everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum from persecution, end of quote. If you have listened carefully, you will have heard that the declaration does not, I repeat, not contain a right to receive asylum, but only a right to ask for it and to enjoy its benefits once you are granted refugee status. The telling gap did not come about by accident, as you can imagine, but was a deliberate choice of states. States were reluctant to extend solidarity to aliens in the abstract and automatically, but wanted to reserve the individual decision to themselves. The 1951 Refugee Convention follows the same model. It contains a legally binding definition of who is a refugee. And once a state recognizes someone as a refugee, which is a, a state's one's own choice on this basis, the convention provides for various rights which the state must grant to a recognized refugee. But once again, the Geneva Convention does not contain any legal right to be granted asylum, but only rights once you are granted asylum, hence no right to asylum, but only rights in or because of asylum. Moreover, the drafters of the Convention did not forget to include what was deemed to be legitimate security concerns of the host state. If a person had committed a war crime, a crime against humanity, or a serious non-political crime, this person did and does not qualify as a refugee in the first place. And in addition, while once admitted refugees are generally protected from expulsion, they can still be expelled if there are reasonable grounds to consider them, quote, as a danger to the security of the country, end of quote. Also in the plays we heard about before, there were security concerns. In both cases, there was a threat of war and military conflict. In modern time, the issue is not so much that of external, but of internal security concerns. How will the newly arrived refugees fit into, host, into their host society? Are they willing and able to integrate? As we can see, already the 1951 Refugee Convention was sensitive to this type of question. Of course, I can't look into that more, uh, but we'll focus now on this perspective of European uh, asylum law, the common European asylum system which has been built up since the 1990s. Something I would like to stress at the very beginning, not only for the many participants uh, from overseas, but also I think for the benefit of many Europeans present in this room, as of today, asylum policy in Europe is to a very large extent a communitarized policy. It means that it is largely, I would say 80% governed by EU legislation and therefore not in the hands of national parliaments anymore. So we're not talking about the legal sideshow here when we talk about EU asylum law. At the same time, the EU has no competency for general migration policy. That remains in the hands of the member state, which is already, let's say, a huge structural problem. Uh, we can look into the discussion more if you, if you wish. To begin with, because I'm focusing on EU asylum law, has embraced uh, the refugee definition of the Geneva Convention, but it has done something important in addition. It has also created a procedural regime. Don't consider this to be a trivial matter. It means, this procedural regime means or implies that whenever an asylum request is made on European soil, at least uh, I have to make that again, uh, say giving credit to Schill, at least uh, as long as member states stick to the rules. Uh, if they stick to the rules, whenever an asylum request is made, EU law requires that this request be examined on the basis of the binding, refugee convention, uh, binding definition from the Refugee Convention, and a decision is taken by the state authorities, which is reviewable by hopefully independent courts. By virtue of this combination of substance and procedure, EU asylum law offers the missing link 
which we did not find before. As opposed to international law, EU asylum law has the added value of containing a real legal individual right to asylum. Again, I don't ignore the many difficult, the practical difficulties that uh, arise, let's say, subsequently. But I think that's a major point to make. And uh, I wouldn't say that Europe is exceptional in that regard, but it's a remarkable, a remarkable fact as opposed to many other places on the planet that basically there, that Europe has a regime where there is an individual right to asylum. This act of solidarity with a wee persons fleeing from mortal danger and persecution has its price as it gives rise to the question who within the European Union shall be in charge of taking care of those seeking refuge in Europe. This is the question of attribution of responsibility. I want to avoid the, the term burden allocation. Hence, the grant of external solidarity provokes the question of internal solidarity within the EU. As you know, that is where the trouble begins and this trouble has a name. I apologize to all the Irish in the room, uh, Dublin. The Dublin regulation creates a system of responsibility allocation in asylum matters among 32 states. The 20 EU member states, and not to forget Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Iceland, they also form part of the Dublin regime. And the basic rule of this regime is that for every asylum request made on European soil, there shall be one and only one competent state that is in charge of examining and deciding the request, and then subsequently taking responsibility to either receive or return the person in question. This one competent state uh, rule tries to avoid two scenarios that were considered equally problematic. On the one hand, the EU wanted to do away with the so-called phenomenon of asylum shopping, meaning the situation where, after the denial of an asylum request, an applicant turns to other countries and go through the process elsewhere. On the other hand, the EU tried to prevent the phenomenon of so-called refugees in orbit, in which asylum seekers would desperately wander around the continent looking for a state prepared to examine their request. Yet, one must be very clear on one thing. Dublin is not, is not an inner European solidarity system and was never meant to be such a system. In practice, I think most of you know that the most important rule of allocating responsibility is Article 13 of the Dublin regulation according to which that member state shall be responsible across whose borders an applicant has irregularly crossed into the union. So that's the major rule of attribution of responsibility. Hence, the Dublin mechanism leads to that the countries of the southern and southeastern periphery of Europe become responsible, legally responsible for the bulk of the people seeking asylum in Europe. There have been several attempts to amend the Dublin regulation because everyone is aware of this huge asymmetry created by, by the Dublin regulation. So there were several attempts to amend the Dublin regulation so as to include a formal redistribution mechanism, a temporary suspension of the Dublin regime in emergency situations, or at least a meaningful financial compensation scheme to better distribute the responsibilities among member states. Yet, whenever it came and comes to introducing an element of mandatory burden sharing among member states, all efforts to obtain the necessary qualified majority within the Council of the European Union have so far bitterly failed. The so-called refugee crisis of 2015 and 16 has only further deepened the ditches. It is important to understand that we are not only simply talking about two opposing camps here. The southern states are, of course, strongly in favor of reforming the existing mechanism. And it is equally clear that many states in the north or west are fully defending the status quo. However, if we take countries such as Germany or Austria, the situation is a bit more complicated. For a long time, they, or I can say we, used to be part of the status quo camp. Since the European courts have started to bar member states, meaning Germany and Austria, in 2011 from sending asylum seekers back to Greece, due to the disastrous living conditions for refugees there, Austria and Germany have 
de facto become Dublin receiving countries because we can't send the people back under the Dublin mechanism uh, anymore. And that pushed the two countries in a way into the camp of reformers. But the ideas of how to reform Dublin from an Austrian or German perspective, as you can imagine, differ quite substantially from those of the southern states. So within the pro-change camp, we already have a major structural split. And then we have the so-called Visegrad state, especially Hungary and Poland. Uh, Viktor Orban was already mentioned before by uh, Luca Mavelli. They insist on of course, I'm simplifying, but it's a major discourse there. They insist on Judeo-Christian, mainly Christian values, and are particularly eager to avoid every mechanism that forced them, that's the most important thing, to admit Muslims or other people that do not fit into their idea of a Christian or whatever they mean by Occidental society. The Visegrad states confront the basic cosmopolitanism of EU refugee law with a rather selective idea of the other. So they say we are open to refugees, but only the ones that fit into our society. Their anathema is the risk of a profound transformation of society. Accordingly, on the political level, they are in favor of reform, but in the direction of a so-called system of flexible solidarity, which means that every member state should contribute what it considers best from its own national identity and national security perspective. You can also call it arbitrary solidarity. Only once in 2015 could the Council agree, by majority decision, on a one-time relocation of 120,000 asylum seekers from Italy and Greece. This measure was immediately challenged by Hungary and Slovakia before the European Court of Justice, which confirmed the lawfulness of the measure. Nonetheless, the obstruction politics, and this not only of the Visegrad states, we could directly include Austria and other member states, has continued so that only a quarter of the envisaged number of people have been re relocated so far. The result of this failure is that the Council has not even made any further attempt of relocation since then. Since the last year, we seem to have a kind of majority in the Council, but this is a formal majority against binding solidarity measures. So in a way, the Visegrad states won the day, if you wish, yet to agree on what not to do is a bad substitute for deciding on how to go forward. The fact is that many governments have become hugely hesitant, if not to say hostile, with any appearance of becoming welcoming to refugees. In the course of the 2015-16 refugee crisis, slogans like Wir schaffen das, the German version of Yes, we can, or Welcome Court Policy, Willkommenspolitik, have turned from an epithet on onans to a technique of discrediting political opponents. Many so-called moderate politicians will say, as a private person, I would be more open-minded and welcoming, but what can you do in these matters as a democratic politician if your refugee policy does not have, does not get the backing of the general population? And they might even refer us to the Hicetides, where both kings, Pelasgus and Theseus, seek the democratic consents of the peoples of Argos and Athens, arguing that admitting the pleas will create burdens and security risks for these very peoples. When Creon's herald asks who rules this land, Theseus proudly responds, quote, you began your speech with the wrong word. There is no ruler here. The city is free of such men. It is ruled by the citizens themselves, rich and poor alike, end of quote. But Theseus could also confidently say, quote, I want the city to vote on this and I'm sure they will agree with me, not only because I wish it, but because they too want it even more than I do. End of quote. We can only hope for a contemporary politician to be inspired more by such role models. Let me come to my third step. As we have seen, Europe is facing a huge solidarity crisis in regard to its common asylum system. This crisis has brought the project of European integration on the brink of collapse, and the crisis is far from being resolved. As you know, uh, we had European elections just in last May, and trying to put together a new uh, commission. Let's see what uh, the parliament and the commission will be able to achieve with the member state in the next five years. But I would, I would advise not to be too optimistic because all the structural problems remain. 
In the absence of an inner European solidarity consensus, EU leaders can at this moment in time only agree on one agenda, the walling off from the outside. This prominently includes the fortification of the European external borders. We heard of the, about the concept already from Schill before. This means additional 